Hello, everybody. It's so good to see you each and every day. Thank you for joining me uh, for Arkansas Live every day, whether you watch in the morning at 7 or the evening at 10. I hear people telling me how much Arkansas Live blesses them and the material blesses them, so thank you. Uh, this week we've been talking about two kinds of prayer, sense rule prayer and spirit-led prayer. We're going to continue this today, so stay tuned. Arkansas Live starts right now. Now, let's go back to Luke's Gospel, chapter 20. We're uh, hitting another bullet point, which is how do we pray? Luke chapter 20, verse 46. Jesus says, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the high seats in the synagogue and the chief rooms at feasts which devours widows' houses and for a show make long prayers, the same shall receive greater damnation. <laughs> he, calls, he calls that damnation. And he said they're going to receive greater damnation. Have you ever, I, I, I've observed these a few times. Usually it's in ceremonies or even church services or whatever you, you've got some ministers. I, I love to do uh Prayers, invocations, opening prayer. I've done it at the state legislature. Uh, I've done it in, in Washington, D.C., CUFI, Christians United for Israel. Um, I, I love to do opening prayers, closing prayers, and so forth. It gives me an opportunity to minister to the Lord and to the people. Uh, but uh, there's an old cliche, uh, he who prays short or a short prayer will be asked to pray again. <laughs> In other words, the, some, some of these functions, it's, and they read the prayer, which means it's been typed out or it's borrowed from somewhere else. But sometimes they just go on and on and on and on. And it's not a spirit-led prayer. It's a sense rule prayer. And it's uh, like the scripture says, it's for a show. I don't know what they're trying to prove, but every time I hear like somebody is going to uh, lead us in prayer, I think, oh boy, um, what, what are they going to say? It just goes on. And I remember um, a meeting that Jeannie and I were attending uh, at a major Christian university. This was many years ago, and I, but I was on one of the... Um, committees. Actually, I was on um, one of the board functions, and we were having a banquet in the banqueting hall of this ministry, major Christian ministry, university. And I was on one of the uh, advisory boards. And so Jeannie and I were seated at this table, and we had friends, ministry friends, and other people that were on the board seated around us. This was a, a room that might hold two or 300 people, banquet-style, uh, individual tables. And the, the program basically was over. We had heard introductory prayer, and we had had our conference speaker and it was a good meeting, and we were all edified and blessed and blah, blah, blah. And so the conclusion of the banquet that night was to have Brother So-and-So come and close us in prayer. Oh, my Lord. He prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed. We'd already taken care of business. It was, actually, this is not a criticism, but there was no need for him to just go on and on and on and on. In fact, it, it, he went so long and it was so dead and dry and anyway, I looked at Jeannie and I said, honey, 
while everybody <laughs> has their head bowed <laughs> and this guy is still praying, let's leave. And she looked at me like, what are you talking about? I said, come on, let's go, let's go. There's no telling how long he will go. He'd already gone five, ten minutes praying. Everybody wanted to leave. So I got Jeannie talked into it. I grabbed her by the hand and we left. We walked out. We got just out of the dining room to turn the corner. And I looked back. <laughs> I heard footsteps behind me. <laughs> and it was brother and sister Copeland. They were following us right out the door. I mean, it, it was ridiculous. It was a sensual prayer. It was a carnal prayer, a fleshly prayer. And the Bible says not to do that. So how are you supposed to pray? You pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And you do not make a long show or vain repetitions. I've wondered sometimes if I've heard people pray, they're not, they're not praying anything that God can answer. They're telling God all the problems. Now, Lord, you know that we're having problems down here. Lord, you know this is blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, well, if the Lord knows it, then why are you reminding, it of him, reminding him of it? We, he, don't, he doesn't need to be reminded. He sees what's going on. Let's pray the answer. Let's pray the solution. Okay. In, in keeping with that, Luke uh, 20, 46, 47, go over to Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 16 through 18. Now this is, we're talking about how to pray. I want you to listen to the difference between sense rule prayers and spirit-led prayers. Here's the Apostle Paul. And he says in uh, Ephesians 6, verse, uh, Ephesians 6, verse 16. I'm sorry, Ephesians 1, verse 16. Cease not to give thanks for you. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, here's what he says he's making mention of in his prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And it goes on. The difference between what it said over in Luke 20 is don't make long or vain repetitious to show off yourself or what you're praying. He said you are to uh, according to the Apostle Paul, you are to pray for the wisdom of God, for understanding, for enlightenment. And that's a sense-ruled prayer. You're praying the Word of God. Uh, Pastor Hagee, I serve with him on the board of CUFI, Christians United for Israel. And every year we go to Washington, D.C. We've been going up there 15 years now. Every year we go to our uh, senators, representatives from all 50 states, and we have a banquet, we have a night to honor Israel, etc. And somewhere in the venue, and I don't know if he does this for this reason, I, I've never asked him, but I kind of think, he always asks me to pray at one of the functions. He asks all the board members to participate in some way. And he always asks me to pray in some capacity. And I always pray the word, but it's very short. And I probably don't pray a whole minute, 60 seconds. That may be why he keeps asking me, because he knows it's going to be short. But you don't, you don't need to make a long, drawn-out process of your, your prayer. Get to the point. Address the issue. Pray according to the Word of God. Now, we've already read 1 Timothy chapter 2. But let's go over there and read again 1 Timothy chapter 2 and let's look at um, verses 1 through 4 because this is very important. You know, whether we have an election year or don't, we're supposed to pray uh, for those 
in authority. 1 Timothy chapter 1 um, 1 Timothy chapter 1 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority. Now that includes everybody that's in authority over us, president on down, president, governors, uh, senators, congressmen, representatives, mayors, police officers. You're to pray for everybody, school teachers. You're to pray for everybody that is in authority. Why? Why are we supposed to pray for them? You may not like them. You may not agree with them. But listen to it. That we, the prayers, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Do we need peace in our society today? You better believe it. Do we need a quiet, peaceable life? Yes, sirree. I just happen to be of the generation that knows and understands what a peaceable life is all about. I, I, I was uh, raised in the late 40s, early 50s, all through the 50s, and I just remember that, you know, it was a quiet and peaceable life. We never locked our door at night. My mother never locked the doors. We didn't need to. There was no fear. There was no crime to speak of like we have today. Uh, I could walk to school or rode my bicycle to school. There were no shopping centers or shopping malls in those days to go to. But we could go to the market. We could go to places, department stores. Of course, they were all downtown. There were no shopping centers like we have today. But you could walk down Main Street midnight and you'd have no fear. It was a quiet, peaceable time. It was like the television uh, program Happy Days, Father Knows Best, Ozzie and Harriet. Uh, it, was, it was a quiet, peaceable time. And we had faith. We had faith in God. We went to church. We believed God. We we, uh, uh, you know, had decent representatives in heads of state and government, etc. I'm not saying it was a utopia or anything like that and that everybody was honest, but we were the benefit of it, a quiet and peaceable life. I don't think many people know what a quiet and peaceable life is like. Unfortunately, our children don't because, you know, in those days, of course, today they have all kind of climb, uh, clamor, chaos, um, noise. Uh, those kind of things create stress. We had none of that. We had no television. Television, I, I didn't see my first television set until I was 10 years old. We didn't have television. We weren't raised with television. We listened to the radio. There were no cell phones. There was no social media. We lived a quiet and peaceable life. <laughs> I tell these stories. That some of y'all may not appreciate them or see the relevancy, but in our household, we had, we had a telephone, but it was a party line. Some of you will know what that was and some of you don't. There were eight people on this party line. And so when the phone would ring, you would pick it up and you'd say hello, but they might be calling the, uh, one of the other seven people that had that number. <laughs> and if you, I know some of you are shaking your head and some of you remember it and some of you don't, but if you wanted to make a call, you had to pick up the phone and see if anybody else was talking <laughs> I look back on it now and I think, how did we ever manage? But it, it's kind of like these old television movies like uh, Green Acres and uh, those kind of things that kind of make light of the way it was. But you, you knew the people that were on your party line. 
I mean, you knew the people. They all lived in your neighborhood. And if you wanted to make a call, you had to pick it up when there was a dial tone. If there was no dial tone and somebody talking, you had to wait till it got through. <laughs> or if it, if it rang, you picked it up. You didn't know who it was. There was no caller ID or anything like that. I mean, you could go outside, and I did this. I did this, play tricks on my sister because she was a teenager too, and she was dating, and she'd have these calls that would come. I would go outside, and I, I, had, I had a ham operating radio, and I was into electronics and all that kind of stuff. And I would climb up on the top of the house where the telephone wire came into the house, and I would take these, I had a headphone set, and I'd soldered these alligator clips on the end of it going to the headphones, and I clipped it onto the telephone box that came into the house, two terminals, and I'd click it on there, and I could listen to her conversation. I don't think she ever knew that. I don't think I've ever told her. But it was so funny because communication in those days was almost zero. But it was a peaceable and quiet life. We didn't have the noise that we have today. I probably used the mute button on my remote control on the television more than any other button. I, I just mute it because I don't want to hear all that stuff. I don't want to hear all the noise. That I, there's more commercials on every hour than there is TV program. I think my wife figured it up one day how many minutes out of the hour uh, that it's full of commercials. How many commercials? Seven to ten commercials uh, in a 30-minute program, something like that. Anyway, I'm getting off on another rabbit trail, but we're talking about having a peaceable and quiet life. If we would pray for those who are in authority, what do we pray for them? We pray for them to be saved. That's in the next verse. We pray for them, verse um, 3, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what we pray for them. We pray for them to be saved. We pray for them to come to the knowledge of the truth. Can you imagine what our government would be like if everybody in it was saved and had the knowledge of the truth? You wouldn't have all this foolishness and this ungodliness that's, that's going on in, in the government today. And, and most people are wondering, why doesn't somebody do something about this? Because government has gotten to the point where it's impossible to function. And that's why Jesus, and now listen to this, that's why Jesus is going to come back and set up his kingdom. For all those of you that have been sucked into the kingdom now doctrine, which is not biblical, Kingdom now means, Jesus, we're going to take over the government. We're going to take over the culture. And we're going to subdue everything unto us. And then we'll let you know when you can come back and set up your kingdom. Now, that's basically the kingdom now doctrine. We're going to take over government, education. Uh, we're going to take over athletics. We're going to take over um, entertainment. And when we get everything subdued to us as believers then you can come back and set up your kingdom. That is not Bible. But some of the people in kingdom now, they don't even know that that's what the kingdom now doctrine is. But the Bible says that Jesus is going to set up his kingdom. And he is going to rule with a rod of iron. Now this is all after the rapture of the church. We'll be gone. We'll be, we'll be in heaven when this takes place. But just to set everything in order and see Jesus is going to be, let me put it how one financier, one banker in London, England, several years ago, they asked him what choice of government he would prefer. And he said, I would prefer a benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> well, you read Isaiah, and that's exactly what Jesus is going to be. He's going to be a benevolent uh, dictator. He's going to control everything is going to be controlled by him. The government will be upon his shoulders. And believe you me, it will be a good government and he will rule with a rod of iron. And 
we will have a quiet, peaceable life. I say we, we won't. We'll be here during the millennial reign, which is his thousand year reign, but we won't be here uh, after the rapture for seven years, the great tribulation. But he comes back, uh, defeats the Antichrist, Battle of Armageddon, and, and he uh, ushers in the thousand year reign, the millennial kingdom. And he's going to rule and reign. It'll be, it'll be wonderful. It'll be like heaven on earth uh, because we'll have a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, let's go over to James, another scripture, before we move on. Let's go to James, and let's go to chapter 5, and let's look at verse 15. Now, we're talking about how to pray. There's a wrong way to pray, and there's a right way to pray. There's sense rule prayer, and there's spirit-led prayer. Sense rule prayer, I read it to you yesterday. I'll say more about this as we progress. Sense rule prayer is the carnal or sense ruled prayer that requires a sign and is contrary, it's enmity in an opposition against God. Now, we're, we're going to talk about that and I'll, I'll give you scripture. Sense rule prayer is enmity in opposition to God and His Word. So when you pray, you don't need to ask for a sign. You know, in the Old Testament, they uh, were instructed to put out a fleece. And I, I won't go into the detail of that, but there's still New Testament Christians, if you want to use that terminology, born-again believers, that are still putting out fleeces. That's sense rule prayer. The Old Testament characters were not born again. They were not filled with the Spirit of God. And they did not deal with things the way you and I deal with them under the new covenant. For a sense rule prayer, a fleece is, is a sense rule prayer because you're asking for a sign. God, give me a sign. Or here, here's the way it used to come to me as a pastor. People would say, and I'm, I'm having these tests run down here at the hospital and I want you to pray that they'll come back negative. And I always ask them, I discern where their faith is, and I ask them, I say, okay, what are you going to do if they don't come back negative? What are you going to do if they come back positive? And they just kind of look at me. That's a sense rule prayer. You're praying according to the senses, what you feel, taste, touch, hear, smell, what the test shows, what the bank account says. What, what, how, how are you going to pray a spirit-led prayer? You pray the Word. A sense rule prayer requires signs. And if the report doesn't come back negative, then what are you going to do? Your, your faith won't work because your faith was in the sign. It was in the sense ruled prayer. And that's the area that Satan operates in the best. He supplies signs and they're negative signs and when you pray what you're thinking is a prayer of faith and you're asking for a sign you're inviting the enemy to get involved in uh, uh, what you're doing because he comes along and puts in a sign and your faith goes out the window i prayed for a woman one time she uh, Went into the hospital, I think it was cancer. This was, again, many years ago. I think it was cancer. And uh, her family had been praying. Her husband had been praying. Uh, all of a sudden, I got a phone call that said, come quick. She's uh, been diagnosed with cancer, and they don't give her long to live. And, and so I went up to the hospital. Oh, my Lord. It was just like Jesus walking into the room. People were crying. Uh, they were carrying on. Who's going to take care of the kids? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? And the Holy Spirit, and I wouldn't do this normally unless the Holy Spirit had risen up in me. And the Holy Spirit told me, he said, you have all those people go wait in the hall. If you're going to pray for her, you don't need them in here. That's Jesus did that. He, had, he cast people out so he could pray because, you know, they were crying and moaning, but then when he told them to get out, they started laughing and criticizing him. 
And that's what I did. I asked them to go step out in the hall and wait until I got through praying. Oh, they didn't like that at all, man. They were upset. And you could feel the gnashing of the teeth. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this unless the Holy Spirit had instructed me. And the Holy Spirit said to me, she does not have cancer and she is not going to die. He said, you tell her that. I said, okay, I will. <laughs> I told her, I looked at her in the face and I said, sister, the Lord just spoke to me. You do not have cancer. Uh, but the test showed, and I said, wait a minute. The tests showed what? The test said you have cancer. The doctor said you're going to die. God said you don't have cancer and you're not going to die. You choose. What are you going to believe? What do you want? Well, she kind of straightened up and cheered up a little bit and said, well, I don't want to die. I want to live. I said, okay. Let me pray for you. I prayed for her. Uh, a day or two, maybe a, three days at the, at the most. <laughs> they called me back and said, uh, Pastor Caldwell, uh, the doctor said that their tests uh, were, how, how would they say, that the tests um, were wrong that she did not have cancer and she was not going to die. So I, I went up there and I told her, I said, okay, you see the difference? Since re your, your prayers were based on the finding. Now, I'm not s saying you don't believe medical science. Medical science has saved a lot of people's lives. But I'm just saying the difference in the sense rule prayer and the spirit-led prayer is you pray according to the word, you get different results. If you pray according to the sense rule prayer, the carnality, the flesh, the signs, you're going to have probably a bad result. Okay, tomorrow we're going to continue with this and we'll go from the sense rule prayer to praying the Word of God. Join me for tomorrow's Arkansas Live. Remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and wherever in the world you're watching. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection, and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.